Hello, and welcome to this program. I'm Rick Guasco. I'm the acting editor-in-chief of Positively Aware. The group conversation that we're having today is a follow-up to the magazine's special issue that was done earlier this year on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Joining me is Candace Montague, who is guest editor of that special issue. She put together the team of writers and developed the stories that appeared in the issue. Candace, it's good to see you. It's good to be here. And I'm really excited about this discussion because it's, it's a long time coming. And um, since the magazine was published, you know, I, I really wanted to hear, you know, more of the feedback from the community as far as like, you know, how, did we hit the mark? Or did we miss it? And, and what the, the uh, people who were interviewed, you know, what did you hear when you when it was published and what kind of feedback did you get? So I'm really excited about this discussion. So as Rick said, I'm Candace Montague, the guest editor for this issue. This is the issue. Can you see it? Oh my gosh, I'm a little blurred, but this is the issue. <laughs> yeah, so I'm the guest editor and I'm also a freelance journalist based in Washington, DC. And I've been writing about, um, been writing about HIV and AIDS for, oof more than 10 plus years. I can't even count at this point. So I've followed this issue for a very long time. Um, and um, that's all I have to say about that. I'll turn it over to Olivia so we can go ahead and get started. All right, Candace. thank you so much. Can everyone hear me? I'll say at the top of everything that I have a bit of a cold, so hopefully I won't have to stop and cough too much, but um, we're, we're going to make it work. And I'm so grateful to, to have been part of this special issue. Just to give a little bit of an intro um, of myself, I'm Olivia Ford, um, she or they pronouns. I'm based in Brooklyn, New York currently, and um, I'm currently the editorial director of The Well Project. Um, and I've worked in, I've worked in HIV related media for about 15 years now. And, um, you know, with most of that time, um, knowing Candace and Rick, and, um, you know, it's really wonderful to get to work with um, Candace as an, as an author, uh, uh, contributing a piece to this uh, special issue that is so, that is such a crucial topic and so sort of close to top of mind in our community in particular, and really has been for many years. I think that the um, issue of diversity, equity, and inclusion um, has a, a it, it, in the kind of for greater public consciousness as sort of a freshness, and people talk about it as being something that's very new, but I think that it's something that um, folks have been talking about in the HIV community and in communities um, of marginalized folks coming up against institutions for, I mean, since that has been the, since that's been a reality. Um, so it was really, again, an honor to get to work on this issue. I was also um, a founding member of the HIV Racial Justice Now Coalition, which five years ago wrote the Declaration of Liberation and articulating an H a racial justice vision for the HIV community, um, which is, if we get a chance to share links, I can share that document. I mean, it's five years old. I always wonder whether it has held up, but um, but really just, it's a really, it's an ongoing journey as far as um, advancing diversity, equity, equity, and inclusion, say it three times fast, as a step towards um, sort of larger social justice goals. Um, and I'm curious, honestly, Candace, as an editor, um, if you would just talk a little bit about in developing the special issue, what were you hoping that readers were going to um, take away from it? It's a huge issue, but it's a really exciting um, opportunity to kind of delve into in many ways. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. You know, for some people, it's, a, it's an introduction, so to speak, about how DEI would look in HIV advocates for others. It's a continuation of something they've been active in or thinking about for a long time now. But for me, I wanted to make sure, you know, first of all, it was really hard to contain everything. You know, D diversity is diverse and it, it goes in many different directions. And so to try to kind of culminate and bring it all together into one special issue was, that was a really big challenge for me. I'll have to say that for, off the top of my head. But um, I wanted to make sure that we at least kind of give a, a broader view of where 
this, this land in advocacy. So it's not just when we talk about diversity, you know, I think in the past people would say, oh, diversity. So let's add a black person or two to the staff and there you go. There's my diversity. But that has, I hope, taken a whole nother, I hope we've taken a bigger, better approach to it now. And so diversity doesn't just mean race anymore and it doesn't just mean gender it also means um your, your, your sexual orientation as well and and in your gender and it's more than just people who are um who can check off the boxes right so it's more than that to me it's about looking at it from how does it look in your administration and in your management how does this dei or how does inclusiveness inclusiveness look in your staffing? How does it look in academia? How does it look in the arts? How does it look in science? Like I said, it was a lot to contain and, I, and I'm sure we've missed quite a few things and you know, we will continue to bring those topics up and, and show how it looks in other ways as, um, as the magazine continues on. But for me, I just want to make sure that I give people a good look at things from a different point of view and from people who are on the front lines who you know, deal with this every day and they have a lot to say. I want to make sure that we got transgender voices involved and make sure that we got Hispanic voices involved. I'm sorry that I didn't get any Asian voices in there. I really, really wanted that. So, you know, there's some things that we hit and some things that we miss. I will admit that that's fine. But as far as like what I wanted to see, I just wanted to make sure that we kind of just show people, even things like Larry's photo collage at the end, how does it look in action? You know, how does this diversity set and hit in the real world? I wanted people to make sure that they see how it would look because this is not something that we're, you know, hoping for. This is something that's actually happening right now in many places and you need to see it and you need to know how to get that in a process and start it or continue it and grow it in your own organization. So that was pretty much my vision for it. So like I said, we missed some things and I hope to continue this on um, as the magazine continues to grow. Indeed, and it's a beautiful special issue. It's impossible to do everything with a few pages, but um, it's an it's an ongoing journey. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, that gorgeous picture, both of those. Um, yeah, thank you so much for um, for your work and also to our panelists for their contributions to the various um, pieces in the issue. I'm gonna briefly um, introduce our phenomenal roster of panelists here and you'll have a chance to kind of you know flesh out whatever I I'm sure I'm going to leave a lot out so with the first question you'll have a chance to kind of broaden your self-introduction um but first I'll intro um uh, Lisa McKinley Beach who's a long time briefly Olivia briefly I yes very briefly very okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, one line one line no periods just one line and um so I'll, I'll run down everyone's uh intros and then we'll get to the uh and then we'll get to the first questions um Lisa McKinley Reach is a longtime national HIV consultant and founder of the Black Women and Bi Biomedical Interventions Institute based in Atlanta Georgia uh, Heidi Bro is an assistant professor at Louisiana State University School of Social Work and founder of Heidi Bro Consulting LLC in New Orleans, Louisiana. And Gerald Garth is director of diversity, equity, and inclusion with the Los Angeles LGBT Center, vice president of community initiatives and programs for LA Pride, and head of media and communications for Global Black Pride. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Um, and just, I, I, you know, honestly, as I, I'm going to start with, um, actually, let's do Walter. So, um, so it would be great just, and and I would love for, actually, since I started with you, Alicia, with the intros, I would love to just get a working definition of DEI, uh, sense of what we are and are not talking about in this conversation. So how does that land for you? So what is kind of, what's, what's your kind of working definition of DEI? We'll but I think when we're talking about DEI work. Um, I don't know that I could frame it any differently than how Candace did it. Um, that saying that, yes, race is an important factor. Uh, and so many of my responses, because of my lived experience, will center that. But we're not talking exclusively 
about race. And when we talk about our HIV movement and our uh, clinical uh, centers and prevention work and all of those things that make that up, we're talking about have we done right by all the populations that are impacted by that? And, uh, and that, that's the most broad definition that, that I can provide. And those populations is, is beyond race, it's beyond gender, it's beyond sexual orientation. Um, and so I'm hoping we can do a, a deeper dive into some of those. Absolutely, thank you for that. Really spot on. Does anyone else want to um, add to that working definition, Heidi or Gerald? I'll just add briefly. Um, again, so excited to be here, and you know, uh, been excited to engage with the, the participants as well. Um, I always like to include um, as a part of our DEI sort of framework is looking at class as a pillar of how we address um, diversity. Um, you know, those experiences of our um, lives really inform how we navigate the world and how people engage. Uh, and so I look at class also as a pillar in DEI that I'm excited to um, explore today. Um, I just want to say I'm so grateful to be here and to be included in this. Uh, thank you so much. And um, for me, uh, one thing I would like to highlight is um, in research and data, a lot of times when people look at diversity initiatives, um, I often have been asking, especially lately, it may be diverse, but is it intersectional? And sometimes we look at this from an interpersonal level that we know, but it's also important that that translates to research and data as well. Um, for equity, I commonly just, one of my favorite things to remind people of is Equality is different than equity. And so you want to know your angle. Are you talking about equality when you mean equity or vice versa? And um, I think, too, we talked about seat at the table for inclusion. Um, it's really important that that's not one seat at the table. It's not a tokenized seat that people are really examining within their organization how that seat is received, the multiple seats, and what space is being made to create a safe environment for all people to um, all people of marginalized identities to both lead um, and then also have uh, safety within that space. It's so real. Um, I obviously on a related point. Um, I'm just curious to hear, and I'll start with you, Gerald, and then other folks, please, we'll open it up for folks who have anything to add. What is important in your experience to do to create an environment in which these kinds of diversity, equity, inclusion, engagements are even possible? You know, what looks different in hiring, in HR, team building, the way a, you know, a person's day is structured, the way that the kind of space is structured, um, just what looks different when there is an earnest sort of process underway to foster such an environment? I think that's a great question, Olivia. And um, I often like to lead with that, um, specifically as it relates to creating a culture that uh, amplifies and elevates diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I often call it in my work, the pre-work. A lot of times, you know, Candace mentioned a lot of times, you know, it's like, hey, we're going to hire folks or we're going to bring in, you know, folks who represent different experiences. And these folks aren't set up to succeed nor is the culture you know, amenable to them to be successful. Uh, and so a great deal of the pre-work is looking at those policies, looking at what I even look at as um, senses of belonging and value. Um, so before I was occupying this space, I was you know, an outreach worker, uh, you know, a HIV tester. I was you know, all these different roles. And I know personally what it can feel like to be a part of a team and not have a sense of belonging or not feel like a valuable contributor to that team, usually from a structural perspective. And so a great deal of the work that um, you know, I've been graced to do is really working with leadership at all levels to look at how are you creating a space in which people feel like they're a valuable contributor to the work? And then also how are we creating 
dismantling and assessing systems that don't uphold that. So I look at it from a couple lenses. Um, I say it's driving in two lanes at the same time. There's the sort of dismantling and reimagining structures piece, but then it's also the uplifting, amplifying, and celebrating um, and aligning folks at the same time. And then hopefully there'll be some place in the middle where folks are able to um, sustain. And so as it relates to policies, procedure, hiring, training, HR practices, one thing that I lean away from too um, is the, the term, um, historically we've called leadership development, which has been sort of connecting to trainings and you know classes, workshops. I lean more into the phrase opportunity alignment in the sense of after trainings, now what? <laughs> after these webinars, now what? Now I'm hired, now what? And so I think institutions and leaders can really look at how are we aligning folks who represent these different experiences and these very rich, um, diverse um, skill sets to set them up not only for opportunities, but to sustain them in those opportunities also. Indeed, thank you. Anyone else have anything to add there? Sort of what do, um, what is an environment in which sort of cultivating these DEI practices and engagements, what does that look like? This, um, this week I um, released a video about uh, one of my last projects in my HIV work is I am now 12 months away, well, technically tomorrow, 12 months away from retirement. Um, and thank you. <laughs> it's been a long journey. And so I'm a that storyteller. That is so bittersweet. <laughs> oh, thank you, Because we, we love you in this, in this environment, man, but I understand the need for retirement. Okay, I'll be quiet now. <laughs> no worries. Um, Kamaria, yes, mama do have to go. I don't have to go home, but I do have to leave this space. Um, <laughs> and so I got 32 years of stories. Uh, but one of the things that I really... Uh, want to leave this group with is this was my last opportunity to make a comment uh, as Rick framed it as this discussion what would I want to leave this group with and that is we have to see the broader picture uh, during the pandemic it became safe to reference racism as a public health crisis. We got the t-shirts to prove it, you know, a, a, a few webinars to show for it. But when we talk about racism as a public health crisis, it immediately focuses on the end user, how racism is impacting the health or the quality of health care for the end user. And not so much about the organizations or the infrastructure or the breakdown of the leadership of the institutions that are providing those services of care. And so if we're not focusing on that, then we're not serious about our commitment to addressing racism as a public health crisis. Why is it that when I walk into a health department that I can see people who look like me who identify as the linkage coordinators or they identify as the disease intervention specialist? But as we go up that ladder and we see the deputy directors, the commissioners of health and the surgeon generals of health, especially in the Southern region, not so much. And so we have to be able to call that out, to call in, what's our plan? How do we support that type of systemic change that is necessary? excellent point that she brings up. And I just want to add up just a little bit more between, between what you said, Laisha, and what Gerald said. Um, that continuation of training and revisiting that topic is so important as well. That's how you build, I think, you know, make sure that that infrastructure is, is tighter, is to continuously get back to it. I've heard that, you know, we have these diversity workshops or training like once every so often when someone is looking at it and then we move on. We don't talk about it anymore. 
but it really needs to be part of your permanent infrastructure. Every year you go through this training or every six months or so you revisit what you learned from the last one and build on it, talk, bring back what you've, what you've experienced from or how you've used your strategies that you've learned from your last workshop in your practice. So I think about things like doctors and how um, we're trying to push more for them to be trained more in inclusivity as far as the um, transgender popula population goes so that they're not um, practicing a lot of discrimination in their practice every day. I mean, you know, you, but this is not something that you want them to learn just one time and, okay, I checked off that box. This has to be something that continuously happens with them so that it is ingrained in their mind that there is a new way of doing things and we need to keep that practice going. But in our in, in that culture of that healthcare system, if that becomes the culture of providing quality care for people of trans experience with, with dignity and respect, every time we have that annual training, that's just a tune up, right? Because we practice it daily. The problem is, as a part of the HR packet, I got to be able to show we had the DI, DEI training. We did that, check that off the box, but the culture from the top down hasn't changed. And that's why we need it every year. And I agree too, there definitely needs to be that level of buy-in from the top down as well. And I would even say, we yes. talk about structures, reimagining what the diversity culture looks like, you know, from an HR perspective, having been an HR, you know, practitioner, there is a certain level of metric and, you know, resolve that you have to be able to speak to. But at the same time, somebody has to be the captain for recognizing why, yes, this might have been a system we've done his used historically, we might need to reimagine in order to yield some different outcomes. And so that might be some, you know, quite honestly, some either levels of discomfort or some challenging to systems that have existed historically. That's the whole definition of dismantling a system. I wanted to say too, I absolutely agree with everything that's being said, um, especially from the top down. And um, for me, it's really important not only um, in uh, executive leadership roles, but that's also reflected in people's board of directors and board roles as well. Um, and that those spaces are uh, of similar structure, respect, um, and um, and that it's not just board roles too, right? Like it's also really important that they're paid, salaried, well-paid um, roles that are in executive staff and not just like I have this one, I'm trans, so not just like this one, I have this one trans person on my board. Um, that doesn't fly with Heidi Bro. So um, the other thing I want to say uh, too is that um, in terms of, and um, you know, I, I've worked in the trans community for and been in for 10 years. I've um, worked in a HIV advocacy community um, for about 10 years now, which is when I first became a HIV tester. Um, and in that space, and uh, one of the things that I've seen, it, both uh, in academics and in the workspace, is that our system for accommodations is not set up for justice. It's really uh, follows capitalism, um, in some ways patriarchy. And so for me, I think it's really important, first and foremost, to trust that people are experts in their own experience. And then also to realize for me, accommodations is like, if you trust that, then someone says, this is what I need. And that institution says, let me find a way to get it for you. But what our system does is the person says, this is what I need. And typically institutions in school say, mm -hmm, okay, well, this is what we have to offer. So see if that will work. And that's not justice. And I really do think that that system has to change. Yeah, absolutely. And again, it's not just the institutions that we ourselves are working in, but the ones that intersect with the institutions that we um, are have kind of the, the agency and the kind of presence to change. Um, but we are in a position also to sort of critique through this lens and see where 
um, as you said so beautifully, all of you, um, there are serious, not even just gaps, but just chasms in um, in support for um, for 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 just inclusion, for 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 equitable inclusion, in, in in so many spaces in our in our work and in this society in general. Thank Thank you and Olivia, so just much. really yeah. briefly, um, I, I will often say too in the work is when we use the word equity, we should be able to replace that word with resources. And so like when we're looking at the work and we're looking at sort of how to, to, to quote you, bridge those chasms, look at where the resources are lying or where they're not. And so if we're committed to equity. We're committed to aligning resources where the needs are. Absolutely, absolutely. And again, sort of returning to those commitments over and over and over again because it is a it's a it's a it's an ongoing journey and there's and there's going to be so many moments where another instance comes up oh we haven't we haven't addressed um the kind of lack of support for equity in this area and justice in this area and because we're working with a system that was actually never built built or meant to um support a uh, diverse array of experiences and uh, I'm about to cough. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, in the first place, so we're recreating, we're dismantling, celebrating, and just having to 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 build in so many ways as we go. Um, who supports this work in organizations? This process, we're, you know, we've talked about as a journey rather than a destination. Um, who ensures that sort of steps towards change are not just replicating white supremacy culture, patriarchy culture, um, that culture in which it's been brought up a couple of times. Um, for instance, folks um, who are more most impacted by the work that the organization does are put in a, in a space of leadership, but are not given the support to thrive in that space and um, are essentially set up for failure. So, um, you know, with unrealistic expectations. Um, so yeah, where's the accountability? Where's the, you know, I'm the, obviously there are many examples of this, but I'm curious to hear from folks, like who who champions this work in organizations? Who could? Well, I can start. Um, I think that's also a great question. I also wanna shout out everybody in the chat. It is popping, so thank you everyone. Um, I'll start, I think it's definitely um, a collective effort. Everybody has a role. I think that's one thing, even as I've been sort of personally moving throughout the work, I've had to remind people consistently that the DEI director is not a magician. It's not his or her or their role to come in and just sort of, voila, here we are. Um, I've referenced it often as a, a, the role of a conductor an, you know, of an orchestra. You know, this individual, you know, should have the autonomy and the kind of, uh, access to be able to move things, assess things, diagnose things and respond to things, um, including resources in a way that um, is responsive to um, the needs of the uh, communities we serve and the folks who serve them. A quote that Heidi said, I say often also as well, that we are the experts of our own experience. And so when we look structurally, how are we including folks in an equitable way in these spaces to contribute their expertise through lived experience as a part of reshaping the system. So that's that role. And I'll say this often too, um, you know, in, in my current role, um, you know, um, there's a great level of white accountability in these spaces. And I think often that's a key role, specifically as we speak around racism, is that there has to be a certain level of accountability, but also um, vulnerability in the sense of recognizing I may have been part of the system that has been um, not of service, um, and then I think um, with all of those, looking at it through a lens of um, transparency, you know, again, like being realistic in the sense of this is either going to take time, money, we can start with this, we can move into this. I think that that helps. But then just kind of to wrap up your question, everybody has a role. It has to start, of, I feel, from my experience with those decision makers and gatekeepers, but then also including folks in an equitable and authentic way um, as a part of that change making. I, I so much agree with uh, Gerald that it, it's everybody's responsibility. Um, but there is, in my opinion, 
a level of accountability that is greater for the executive leadership and the decision makers than the remaining uh, uh, staff members. And here's the reason why, because those individuals really are setting the stage for the culture of the organization. Uh, if you don't believe it, be a lower level staff and step out of line of what the agency's beliefs are. And you may be getting this message of, let me give you some advice for your next job, right? <laughs> and so there is power then in that position. Um, when I first uh, took a position with the state of Georgia uh, Health Department, one of the first initiatives that we launched um, was a, a, a project called um, Taking Control. I think that's what it was. See, I told y'all I'm, I'm getting older now. Yeah, I was taking control, a statewide initiative for gay and bisexual men. When you hear that now, it seems like, oh, that, that's cute. But the advocacy and the war I had to go through to get the state of Georgia to use the term gay and bisexual. Now, some of you um, may not know me, uh, but let me just give you this 10 second overview. Um, I'm, I'm not gay and I'm not bisexual, right? So if they didn't choose those titles, that personally doesn't impact me at all, right? I'm still going to get my check from the Georgia Department of Health. So why go to war? Me the head of the cisgender woman, why go to war for two terms, gay and bisexual? Because I'm in a position of influence that the folks below me who say, you know, what pride I could have for this project to be able to show up as I am, as a gay man, as a bisexual person. So, that's my second, you know, all to call um, to this group is that when we are in positions, even if the buck doesn't stop with you, but you may be in a higher position where you can influence and impact change. It is your responsibility to be in that seat. Uh, and as Heidi said, we need more than one, but unfortunately, there oftentimes only one there. And if I'm the one that's going to occupy it, then I have to take the needs of the people we serve in that space. And so Georgia ends up with a statewide initiative about gay and bisexual men. And so what that did for me was to recognize, even though the bug didn't stop with me, it was enough influence through my position to make something happen. I um I thank you so much for it. I, I totally um I love all the points being made. Um and I want to say I think one of the things that's so important about people speaking up and why the need for DEI, which was highlighting this issue, is so crucial, is because our laws and our policies don't make sense. They don't match up. Um, and so like one example I was um, thinking of in terms of like decision making, sometimes we see these things on social media and the news and they're like, oh, this like big corporation did a clothing ad and it was racist. And people are like, how could that happen? And it's like, well, you're telling on yourself who's at your decision making table when you do that. So um you know, another way our like laws and our uh, policies don't make sense um, that come to mind is we have uh, we have some level of federal protections that were passed for LGBTQIA plus employees. And at the same time, I have not seen an overwhelming amount of cases 
being prosecuted for discrimination, although we know for sure that that is very widespread and has been going on for years. Um, I also want to say uh, in this space, I'm sorry, I'm going to say something that is a little difficult, so take a breath, um, but HIV criminalization laws don't make sense in this country. CDC has acknowledged U equals U. And so we know that our laws and our policies, they don't make sense. And we know that if there were more people like the people in this panel and the people that are attending this today, making the decisions, things would probably be different. But for now, we have to organize and do the best that we can um, to and you know get out information like we are with this issue and with this talk today. Heidi, it might have been difficult, but it was right. And I think if you just start reading in the chat that you got some supporters, you got some supporters on the screen. Uh, and it is unfortunate. Yet again, advocates, advocacy is still needed for an issue that doesn't follow any science, any science. And the fact that we're talking about, again, putting the onus of an act that two uh, consenting folks come together to say, let's do this, but only one of us walks away with the responsibility. And that's so unfair. And that talks about your framing about the lack of justice um, in, in this structure. Yeah, exactly. And it shows more. And of course, I mean, such a comment is absolutely welcome needed in this space. Um, and there's there's so much, so many amens and ashes to, to just bringing down these just uh, unjust criminalization in general, specifically on HIV, but let's not just, you know, certainly not just stop there. Um, as far as these um, laws that we see over and over again are more about um, control of people's bodies, control of people's movements, um, than about every, anything having to do with public health and certainly any, anything having to do with somebody getting justice. Um, thank you all so much for your words. I, let's see, I'm going to kind of, based on some of the questions that I've seen in the chat, kind of modify a question that I had about kind of principled, equitable transition of leadership um, to individuals who are more directly affected by, accountable to the work um, that an organization does in the communities it serves. Um, I'm curious about sort of how organizations plan for that, but really also how, you know, kind of more pointedly, how does a longtime founder, executive director, you know, how does how does an individual leader plan for that? And frankly, and this is I can't I don't even know who made the comment. I've been trying to keep up with the chat. It's like lightning fast, but this is a point that comes up a lot in our work: is that people, we're folks working in HIV, good hearts, well-meaning folks have been you know doing what they consider to be justice work for a long time. How to um, let people know that maybe who who may believe that they have reached the destination of um, it's sort of working for justice and having sort of justice in their organization know that actually um, change is coming that is uh, that goes far beyond what has already been what 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 they may believe have been kind of all the check marks that they have um, sort of checked off in their work in the past, if that makes sense. Go ahead, Gerald. <laughs> I think Go we took ahead. that deep sigh at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> I think and that, that is a great question. It's a, a rich one as well, because it's so relevant, you know, specifically at this time where we're seeing a lot, a number of great legacy leaders sort of um, um, looking toward the next version of their lives. Um, from my experience, um, it has had to happen in a couple, in a few ways. Um, and I know like we're specifically speaking to um, sort of the structural component of the work, but I'll dare say from my experience, there's a great deal of the need for emotional and sort of uh, mental support for sort of leaders in transition. A lot of individuals have found a great deal of um, identity, um, personal identity in their roles and their organizations. Um, and, you know, it could be, you know, very much traumatizing for someone to sort of see themselves outside of something that they built from the ground up. Um, and um, 
I've experienced this as a not so young anymore, but as a younger leader, sort of, you know, coming in with gusto and this is what we're going to do and having more senior leaders see that sort of fervor as a sort of judgment on what they did or didn't do or, you know, me sort of coming in and not paying homage to what they built when they didn't have the level of resources that I have today. Um, and so and Leisha will tell you, I love Leisha dearly. She, she's known me when I was a this young and loud, <laughs> younger and louder. Um, that a lot of it is really um, um, strategic in the sense of, well, yes, we do have to move the work forward, but how do we do this in a way that we're, in, in which we're still all validated? Somebody mentioned this earlier too, you know, and still have a sense of connection and belonging. I know specifically in our community, um, from my own experience too, a lot of seniors have battled with, you know, invalidation and being discarded and being erased. And, you know, we've seen that since the beginning of this work, of, you know, of this uh, epidemic. And some of those are perpetuated even in kind of transitional leadership spaces. And so while that doesn't specifically speak to sort of the kind of strategic organizational, you know, um, restructuring, that component of it, I think, is a key part that's been historically sort of not included which is really just sort of further fueled this division versus the elders, you know, kind of this division between uh, organizational leadership change. One of the things that I, I spoke quite a bit about over the, the past couple of years um, is this idea or concept of the founder syndrome. And that in many ways, let, let, let me preference this with my comments come from a place of love because I also got to talk about myself a little bit um, and I, I'm not going to cause harm to myself. Um, but in this founder syndrome, you think about the folks who were young and committed they didn't have another choice, right? People who were literally in the fight for their lives. Those 20-something, those 30-something are now 60-something, even 70-something. And if we don't take moments to step back and reflect and retool, to look at the space I need to occupy now is not the same space I might have needed to occupy in the 80s as my partner, as my lover was transitioning, as I was in the fight for my own life. And it takes a lot of courage. Thank you. It takes a lot of courage to be able to say that to, to be relevant to the movement means I might have to move or shift myself out of the current role. And that current role might indeed be something that I built. I built with someone that I love that is no longer here. But here's the thing about learning how to keep the legacy alive. You may not be the CEO anymore, right? but you took the time to invest and to sow into this leadership that's gonna get us to the end of the epidemic. When I made my decision about retirement um, two years before it was gonna happen, I did it intentionally. Why? Because for me, it would be an indictment to walk away from a movement that I've been a part of for 32 years and take away all my networks and, and the contacts and the experiences and the mistakes and the successes and the community mobilization, that stuff I needed time to start sharing with all of you. And the things I've chosen to be a part of since then was an opportunity for me to sow into you you to know some of the stories and, and the history behind our movement so we don't waste time, focus on things that weren't a, weren't a success then. 
But it takes that mindset for those of us who are um, young at heart uh, to invest into those who are young in age. May I add really briefly too, I think that's so super. Um, I'd like to echo, um, Heidi also brought up a board of directors and board of, you know, governance boards. That is a space too where we really should be investing in emerging leaders, um, specifically ones, you know, of lived experience and who are committed to the work. I have also recognized, you know, again, having been around a little longer and bringing under a, a, a number of young folks under my tutelage, mentorship, there's so much like uh, passion. <laughs> a lot of times it's not sort of aligned with skills. <laughs> and there's a sort of vulnerability that needs to go in both directions in the sense of young folks who can have that passion coming in saying, I do have something to learn. I'm open to sort of taking this, you know, uh, movement to the next level. But then it also has to be that shared commitment from seniors in the sense of, you know, I do recognize I've taken this as far as I can go, and I trust that you will take it to the next level. So it can't be one sided. It has to be in both directions. Um, and a lot of that really comes with um, really genuine and authentic relationship building. Um, so, Alicia, like you said, you you had an announcement two years out and you had time in between where you were able to nurture, foster and sort of and not even two years, the last 32 years you've been relationship building. But just in the sense of when we look at um sort of sustainable transition it can't be like okay you got 90 days and here you go figure it out you know it has to be this really authentic right. commitment in both directions oh good i go ahead i want to say in this space um when we talk about this the first thing that comes to mind is that white people have been promoted for mediocrity for far way too long and period. <laughs> that's a state. That's the statement. Um, and uh, I think in terms of looking for uh, leadership and more inclusive leadership for people that are um, straight, cisgender and white, um, making more room for that for me doesn't mean necessarily making a lateral move. Right. We're talking about an entire system dismantling a system. And um, the last thing that I want to say um, is in terms of DEI practice, it's just my recommendation. Please stop looking at gaps in people's resume and asking them to explain it. The reason why people have gaps in their resume is because they were oppressed so bad that they weren't sure that they would ever recover for it from it. So they needed to make a move or health systems has have failed them or health systems have failed the people that they love. That's a very capitalist practice that we use to vet to vet candidates. And it's it's time we change that. It's time we change university requirements, doctor requirements, master requirements being prioritized over people who have been in and loved and served the community and know best, know better than anything that anyone can learn in a textbook or from, you know, watching a video or a TED talk. They know best. They are the leaders in this community and they have rightfully deserved those positions, and you will find that that also is best for your organization. Um, so I will say a little bit, I know we talked about our younger selves, so a little bit about me. Um, from New York, I live in um, the South now, although um, this is a picture of my favorite tree in Brooklyn behind me, so a little bit subversive. I always say I'm Heidi Bro from New York. Um, and I was actually disowned when I first came out. So um, even if you're someone who feels like I've done it wrong in the past, but I want to do better now, I want to say that just being here, I love you. I thank you. I was raised by community and people that um, took me in and, and did this work. And I truly mean in my heart that I have so much love for everyone trying to make a change. Wonderful, Heidi. Oh, brilliant. Thank you so much. 
Thank you, Heidi, oh. for joining us. And thank you for sharing that. All of it, everything you said was amazing. Thank you so much. Oh, this beautiful dynamic panel. I'm so glad to have this. This particular collection of voices is just, just absolutely stunning, stellar. I'm so glad you're all able to be here. And we have a few more minutes too. Can we bring people off? Mute. Do folks want to ask questions in the chat? I don't know if chat questions have been being pulled. From I the know chat. that um, this has been a lively conversation in the Absolutely. chat. Uh, you have me so engaged. I keep missing when I'm supposed to respond. Uh, <laughs> but I knew, I knew uh, that with this many folks on this uh, discussion, that there were expertise that was in the space, in the space. And so thank you for sharing that with us as well. Absolutely, I just wanna echo the same. I've been also trying to keep up, uh, not trying to be distracted or looking like I'm not paying attention, but it's just so rich. It could be its own, you know, just experience and, you know, so much um, greatness in this shared space, not just the panel, but the participants. And thank you for everyone for what you do as well. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. I will say perhaps if there's any, you know, we have just a couple of more minutes, but if there's a specific question that people are, that someone sort of burning to lift up to have folks respond to if they want to drop it into the chat, um, it, we don't have to do it that way. I mean, certainly it's been a really rich discussion. We, um, and so much engagement in the, bet between the, the chat and the speakers and also in the chat as well. Um, but if, if someone has something that they would like to have responded to, um, if you want to drop it, you know, in the chat here so that um, we can spend the last minute or so responding to that. Thank you to our moderator. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, let's give it absolutely. We'll take this minute for Olivia. That's what we'll do. Yes. <laughs> Olivia, thank you so much. Yes, and Rick Candice, thank you for organizing. Oh, Gerald, I, Candace, as I said earlier, I'm so grateful to all of you individually and then to come together like this in a group. Um, we are greater than the sum of our individual parts, Yeah. especially when we come together like this. Um, I'm being reminded to... Uh, remind everyone that there will be um, a post webinar survey that we'd appreciate you to uh, take part in, uh, share your thoughts and, um, and your comments. So that'll be coming out. You can also find the issue. Uh, you can find positivelyaware.com or well, you can find Positively Aware and you can find the special issue on diversity, equity, and inclusion by going to positivelyaware.com. Oh, brilliant. We're oh, just about right on time. I think we're going over just a little bit as we wrap things up. I don't know if anybody else has anything. Yeah, Olivia for president. I, oh my gosh, I that job, please, <laughs> I'm with my worst enemy. <laughs> but I am so honored to be part of this conversation and we do need more conversations like this and practice community like this, you know, to really, um, to, 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 beyond talk, which is not what everyone's doing here. We're talking about actions that are being taken and happening right now, but really just, you know, just space to check in with one another, space to lift each other up, space to, you know, sort of go when that work gets lonely and hard um, and you feel like you're being gaslit left and right um, around it. Yeah, I'm just really um, so glad for uh, folks, folks' engagement and passion and desire to, um, move this level of change. Thank now you. Now we are two minutes over, but um, thank you all so much for being here, everyone. Thank you again, thank everyone. You. Happy holidays. Thank you.